Welcome back to Digital Systems 2, and in this video, we're going to discuss multiplexers and demultiplexers. And uh, we only have one basic objective in this particular video lecture, and that's to just learn what is a multiplexer, which we call a MUX for short, and what is a demultiplexer or a DMUX, how do they work, and what are some applications. We'll start with a multiplexer, or a MUX for short. A MUX selects one of n input data sources and transmits the selected data to a single output. We call this multiplexing. Here is a block diagram of what a multiplexer might look like. So we can have a number of inputs. These are our data inputs. Only one of these data inputs will be allowed to pass through the MUX to the output, and that's controlled by the select inputs down here. Select determines which input out of all of these inputs is allowed to pass. So you can imagine that inside the MUX is a rotating switch, if you will, and the switch will connect to one and only one input, allowing that one input to pass through the MUX and to the output, and we control which one is allowed to pass with the select inputs. So the multiplexer is called a data selector because you can control or select which data is allowed to pass to the output. And again, that's all controlled by the select inputs that you see at the bottom of the MUX. Here's an example of a two input MUX. An application of this might be if you have a digital system that uses two different master clock signals and you wanna switch between them very easily. You could apply the high speed clock to one input and the low speed clock to another input and then you can select between your two inputs which one goes to the output based off of this input here. So internally, here's what a two input MUX would look like. You've got an AND gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, and an inverter. So our two inputs would go here, I1 and I0. And then we have our select input. If the select input were a zero, that zero would go into this AND gate right here. The output of this AND gate would be nothing. However, that zero would go into the inverter here, be inverted, then the output of this AND gate would depend on I zero. If I zero was a one, then you'd have a one coming out of the AND gate, you'd have a one going into the OR gate, and you'd have a one coming out of here. Ultimately, the output here would depend on what I0 is. If S were a 1, that 1 would get inverted here, become a 0, and this AND gate would always give you an output of low. Meanwhile, this AND gate would depend on whatever I1 is. So we would say that the output of this particular MUX is I0 and not S, or I1 and S. And ultimately, the output will depend on whatever I1 or I0 is when the appropriate select input has been applied. So we can choose which signal will pass based off of this select input. Here are some examples of, of MUXs that can take more inputs. So if you have a 4 to 1 mu multiplexer, 4 inputs, 1 output, that means you need 2 select inputs so that you can select one of four combinations. So if select is a zero, zero, then I zero will be the one to pass. If select is a zero, one, then I one will be allowed to pass. If select is one, zero, I two will be allowed to pass. And if select is one, one, I three will be allowed to pass. This is the basic idea of how a multiplexer works. So you have several inputs, only one is allowed to pass through, and it's controlled by the select inputs at the bottom of the box. If you had an eight to one box, you would have eight inputs and three select lines. This picture also includes an enable. Sometimes you will have an enable to your box, so you'll have to check to see that the box is enabled for outputs and is, assuming the MUX is enabled, your outputs here will depend on your select lines S1, S2, and S0. So again, think about 
your select lines creating an input code. So if select is 111, 111 is seven in binary. That means input seven is the one that will pass. So your code at the bottom corresponds to which input is allowed to pass to the output. So there are two, four, eight, and 16 input multiplexers that are available in the TTL and CMOS families. Um, these basic ideas can be combined or cascaded so that you can multiplex a larger number of inputs if you needed to. Here's what the internal circuitry would look like for a four input MUX. Here's your four inputs, I0, I1, I2, and I3. Your select inputs are down at the bottom. And we have four AND gates, a four input OR gate, and three inverters. So let's say, for example, that S1 and S0 were both a one. So we'd have a one here. We'd have a one here. And then the output of this AND gate would be controlled by I3. If I3 was a one, a one would pass. If I3 was a zero, a zero would pass. Meanwhile, all of the other AND gates would have an output of zero because S1 and S0 eventually get inverted in several other places. And you can follow that on the diagram and see that all of the other end gates would have an output of zero, regardless of what the other inputs are. So a multiplexer again, will just output one of your inputs based on the selects. Some of the applications that you might see that would involve a multiplexer includes data selection or data routing parallel to serial, serial conversion, operation sequencing, and waveform or logic function generation. We're going to do an example of logic function generation a little bit later in this lecture. Here's a system for displaying two multi-digit BCD counters at one time. Notice that we have two multiplexers that are used. Here's your select. The select input will control whether I1 passes or I0 passes in both of these multiplexers. So depending on which one of these inputs passes, that will show you what's going to go from the MUX into this BCD to seven segment decoder and then to display on your screen. So the inputs to these MUXs are from counters. We have a counter here. We have a counter here, a counter here, and a counter here. And the MUX basically controls which counter's output gets to be displayed. And again, that's all based off of your counter select input. So now let's do an example. We're going to describe the circuit's operation below. So I want you to just take a look at it. What do you see? What do you think it does? I'll tell you what I see. I have two muxes. I can see that the output of each mux is connected to an OR gate. I can also see that each mux has eight inputs. And each mux has three selects. And one enable that is active low. Now the user is going to enter data right here. Notice that S3 is the piece of data that is fed to this enable. And then down here, where it's inverted and fed to this enable. So that means that if S3 is a zero, this MUX will provide an output and this MUX will be disabled. If S3 becomes a one, the first MUX will be disabled, and now the second MUX will output data. So that means that I can input a code anywhere between 0, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, 1. And that third, um, that third input right here, S3, is going to control which MUX is active at a certain point in time. So for example, if I put in the number 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. S3 is a zero, these are all ones. This MUX will be enabled, this MUX will be disabled, 
and the output that I'm going to get is going to come from this mux input 7. But now if I put in the number 1111, so I have 1111, this mux will be disabled, the bottom mux will be enabled, and then I'll get this input at the output. So what we have here are two 8 input muxes that have been combined to create a 16 input mux where S3 controls which MUX is enabled. So when S3, S2, S1, and S0, or anything between 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 1, 1, basically 0 through 7, the top MUX will be enabled. And then when the inputs for our selects are 8 through 15, the bottom MUX is enabled. So I have a way to take 16 individual inputs and use a multiplexer to select only one to go to the output, which is labeled as output X, at any point in time. So this is a way that we might cascade two muxes together in order to be able to select from a wider range of inputs. Now let's look at another example, similar to the one before, where we're going to determine the function performed by this circuit by generating a truth table for the output. So what I want you to do right now is take a second and try to create a truth table that would describe what output Z is going to be based off of S1 and S0. So hit pause, try to figure this out on your own, and then check back in a few minutes for the answer. So with this circuit, we have three muxes. Each one is a two input mux. Notice the two muxes on the left are controlled by S1. The mux on the right is controlled by S0. So what we're going to do is create a truth table to describe which one of our four inputs is going to pass to the output depending on S1 and S0. Let's start with the first case, S1 and S0. Let's say they're both 0. If S1 is a 0, that means I0 is going to come out of this mux. And I2 is going to come out of this mux. Now, so we have I2 going in here and I0 going in here. If S0 is also a 0, that means that this input is the final output to Z which means I0 is going to pass to the output. If S1 is still a 0, but now S0 becomes a 1, now this output is the one that will pass. So I2 is the one flowing out of this mux and into I1. I2 will now pass. Now let's say that S1 is a 1. That means that the bottom mux will output I1, the top mux will output I3. So what's going to pass is ultimately controlled by S0, which is going into the last mux. If S0 is a 0, I1 will pass. If S0 is a 1, I3 will pass. So this truth table will help us to describe the output of this particular mux, which has an interesting formation because the select inputs don't form a binary code that corresponds to a single input. So for example, 0, 1 is 1 in binary, but we get output 2, output I2. So this is a unique MUX, which has a slightly different operation than a standard 4-input MUX. The 74 ALS 157 is a, an IC that you can use as a multiplexer. It actually contains two, I'm sorry, it contains four, two input multiplexers inside. So we have one, two, three, four multiplexers inside. We're going to generate a truth table to illustrate how this works. And the only information that we have is this picture on the screen. Based off of what you see here, let's try to identify how does this work? I have some inputs that go in here. I1A, I1B, I1C, I1D, I0A, I0B, I0C, I0D. So you have eight inputs. 
We only have one select. And then we have four outputs. We also have an enable that is active low. So now we're gonna create a truth table to describe what's gonna happen here. So first of all, we know the, the enable has to be low. If the enable is not low, we will not get an output. Next, we can use this internal diagram to see what would happen with the select input. Let's just assume select is zero. If select is zero, it gets inverted right here and becomes a one. And that one is gonna go here, 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 and here. So notice that we've got these uh, orange AND gates that are getting a one if select is zero. So if select is zero, notice what is also connected to each one of these AND gates as an input. Input zero. Input zero A, input zero B, input zero C, input zero D. And now take a look at the third input to all of your AND gates. It's your enable. As long as your enable is low, the output of this will be high, and all of your AND gates will have a one. So when select is zero, the output depends on whatever inputs zero A, zero B, zero C, and zero D are. Which means that I, if I reverse that and our select is one, then we'll get inputs 1a, 1b, 1c, and 1d as our output. So when we make a truth table, we're going to show, first of all, that if the enable is high, we don't care what select is, and your outputs will all be low. But if the enable is low and select is zero, your outputs will be I0A, I0B, I0C, and I0D. And if your enable is low while your select is high, then you'll get input 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. So this MUX has eight inputs and four outputs. So we can get four outputs at a time with only one select input. So next we're going to do another example, more of an application really, where we're given an input of x7, x6, x5, x4, x3, x2, x1, x0 equals 10110101. We're going to draw the truth table and the waveform for the operation of the MUX below using that input. Assume that the counter begins counting up from zero. What does this circuit behave as? So we have a lot going on here. Let's first start by analyzing what we've been given in the picture. First, we have a storage register. The outputs of the storage register are given right here, and we know what those outputs are. Next, we know that the outputs of the register are being fed as inputs into a MUX. Notice that the select lines of the MUX are controlled by a counter, a mod 8 up counter that we can assume has begun counting up from zero. And then we have an enable, which has been set to zero, which is good because it's an active low enable, so we know that the MUX has been enabled. So our question is, basically we have to draw the truth table and the waveform for the operation of this MUX and then figure out what does it behave as. So let's start with the truth table. We can see that the select lines are controlled by the output of this counter. So as the counter is counts with each clock cycle, the select lines will change. As the select lines change, a different piece of data will travel to the output. Let's make a truth table to show what that would look like. So first you're going to start by writing the outputs of the counter, QC, QB, and QA, as the counter counts. So we're gonna assume it starts from zero, first clock pulse, and then it's counting up. Now we can see that if QC, QB, and QA are 0, 0, 0, I0 will get to pass to the output. Where's I0? I0 is connected to X0, and what is X0? X0 is given right here as a 1. So we can see that as the counter counts up, 
the MUX is going to switch the output from I1 to I2 to I3 to I4 and so forth. And that's what we're going to see at the output. So the output will begin as 1, then it'll be 0, then it'll be 1, then it'll be 0, then it'll be 1, 1, 0, 1. As the counter counts through, the select inputs change. The select inputs control what goes to the output. So I1, I0 through I7 will cycle through the output. So now let's look at a waveform of what that would look like. So as the clock makes the transition, the counter counts, the select lines change, the output Z changes from X0 all the way through X7. So the next question is, what does this behave as? Think about our discussion early in the semester about registers. It's a parallel to serial register. Parallel data goes in, only one piece of data comes out at a time. This behaves like a parallel to serial register. Sometimes a MUX can be used to implement a logic function. This is another application of a MUX. Uh, we're going to figure out how a MUX can be used to implement the truth table below. So let's say that all I've been given is a truth table. I know that when the outputs are 0, 0, 0, or I'm sorry, when the inputs are 0, 0, 0, the output has to be 0, and so forth. And the only thing I can use to build a circuit to create this output is a MUX. That's it. I don't have anything else. How can I do that? First, let's determine the output of this truth table. We're going to write our sum of product terms, sum of product terms. So I have one, two, three places where the output is one. I'm going to write the sum of products for that output, which would be not C, not B, and A, or not C and B and A, or C, B, and A. That's the first step. The next step is that we're going to consider A, B, and C as the select inputs to our MUX. So for example, if A, B, and C are all 1, we should get a 1 coming out. If A, B, and C were all 1, that means I7 would be coming out. So as long as I7 was a 1, we would create that row in our truth table. And we would apply that same line of thinking for the other two rows where Z is a 1. So look at how we would wire the MUX. We would wire the MUX so that whenever C, B, A matches any one of the combinations where I want a one, look at that corresponding input and connect it to power. When CBA is one, 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 I want a one. So one, one, one is a seven, connect input seven to power. When CBA is zero, one, zero, I need a one. Well, zero, one, zero is two, so connect input two to power. When CBA is zero, zero, one, I need a one. So 0, 0, 001 corresponds to the number 1. Connect input 1 to power. For all the other combinations, I want a 0 out. So connect all the rest of them to ground. So now I can use this multiplexer to implement a logic function. This multiplexer will give me the truth table shown right here. If I apply the select inputs as shown with C, B, and A, I will get a 1 only three times. When C, B, and C and B are 0, while well, A is 1. While C is 0, B is 1, and A is 0, or when they're all 1. Because when I apply those inputs to my selects, I'm only, I, I, I then have wired this so that the inputs that should be high, when the select input corresponds to that input number, are wired to 5 volts. This is how we implement a logic function using a multiplexer. And there's our function. Here's another application. The circuit below shows an eight input MUX can be used to generate a four variable logic function, even though the IC only has three select inputs. So 
In the previous example, we had three select inputs. We had enough inputs to generate the output that we wanted. Now we have a four input variable logic function and only three select inputs. So three of the logic variables A, B, and C are connected to the select inputs. The fourth variable D and its inverse D prime are connected to the selected data inputs of the MUX as required by the desired logic function. That's a long way of saying this was intentionally designed this way. Set up a truth table now to show what the output is going to be for every possible combination of A, B, C, and D. Notice that some of the, uh, some of the inputs to this MUX have been wired high or low. What we're going to do is prove that this wiring provides this output. So we're working backwards. In the first example, we had the output expression, and we had to show how do you wire the MUX. In this example, the MUX has been wired. Prove that it will implement this expression. So we're going the other way. So it's already been wired. It's already been designed as described up here in the directions. Prove it. Does this actually implement this function? And the first thing you're going to want to do is create a truth table showing your output Z for every possible combination of the input variables, A, B, C, and D. So that's where we're going to start. Here's my truth table. Here's my truth table. What you're going to want to do is walk through this one step at a time. So for example, if D, C, B, and A are all zero, I know that A, B, and C are going to control the select lines. So A, B, and C, if they're all zero, I'm going to have I zero at the output, and that's connected to ground. That's why I have a zero right here. If C, B, and A are zero, zero, one, I now get I one, which is connected to input D. So in this case, the output's going to be whatever D is, and D is currently zero. If C, B, and A are zero, one, zero, I should get I two. I2 is connected to 5 volts. If C, B, and A are 0, 1, 1, I should get I3. I3 is connected to ground. If C, B, and A are 1, 0, 0, I now get the output of this inverter, which is connected to D. What's D right now? D is a 0. I'm going to get the output of that inverter as the output for Z, so I'm going to get a 1. We can see that I5, I6, and I7 are all zero. So the next three rows are zero as well. Then we're going to repeat that process to say now D is a one instead of a zero. So whenever we get the output of the inverter for I4, the output of that inverter is now going to be zero instead of one. And we repeat that same process to create our truth table. Now that we have a truth table, how can we use that to prove this MUX implements this expression? I would say make a K-map and write the expression for the output. If this truth table matches this expression, my K-map should show me that. So let's see if it does. I have a pair of ones right there. I have a single one right there and a single one right there. If I write, write the expression for those three circles, I do indeed get what I started with. So by taking the circuit that was given, creating a truth table, taking that truth table and creating a K-map and getting the same expression, we verified that this circuit will implement this expression using the, uh, the MUX. Now let's move on to demultiplexers. Demultiplexers are the exact opposite of multiplexers. Instead of a data selector, it's called a data distributor. A DMUX takes a single input and distributes it over several outputs. The select lines, just like before we had select lines, we still have those with the DMUX. They select 
uh, which output data will be transmitted. So the data, the data input right here, goes in right here. And with the DMUX, the select line determines where that output goes. Which, which output is it gonna go to? Output zero, output one, output two. Your select input will control where your input goes. So here's an example of a one line to eight line DMUX. So you have one input data. One input, one piece of input data, or one place for data to, to go in. You have eight possible places for the data to come out of. Which line will be active is all up to the select inputs. So if select was 100, zero, then your input data I would be seen on output number four. And to the right, you can see the internal circuitry for a DMUX. Here's your input data I that goes to every single AND gate. And your AND gate will only be high depending on your inputs, select zero, select one, and select two. Here's an example of a one to four DMUX. One piece of input data goes in here. Your select lines determine where your input data goes, Y0, Y1, Y2, or Y3. Here's a one to two DMUX with the same idea. Let's do a quick example using a demultiplexer or a DMUX. We're gonna apply the waveforms below to the inputs of the 74 ALS 138 DMUX as follows. Notice we have our three selects. We have eight outputs that are active low. We have some enables, but here one of our enables is connected to our piece of data. That's E1. E1 is our data input. We have E2 and E3. We can see that E2 is connected to ground and E3 is connected to five volts. So. This waveform right here is being applied to E1. That's what this is telling me. This waveform right here is being applied to A0. This waveform right here is being applied to A1. This waveform right here is being applied to A2. So our select inputs are being determined by waveforms B, C, and D. These are our selects, and our enable is being controlled by waveform A. This is an active low enable, so you should immediately be able to see that every single time waveform A is high, the output of your MUX will be disabled. It'll be disabled because your enable has to be low for the output to be enabled. So let's take a look at how the waveforms would be. And we're gonna draw the waveform for every single output. So keep in mind, I've uh, redrawn this picture here showing A2, A1, and A0 as our selects. That's the same waveforms you had for B, C, and D. And our waveform A, I've just relabeled it as your active low enable one. So again, we can see the only time the output is even enabled is when E1 is low. All these shaded areas is when E1 is low. That's when your output is enabled. So other, uh, other than these shaded parts, your output here is always going to be disabled. And since these are active low outputs, that means your output is always high. So here's what the output would look like. So right here, we're enabled. And the inputs are 0, 0, and 0. 0, 0, 0. So that corresponds to output 0. Since these are active low outputs, output zero will go low right here. And then right here, everything will be high because it's disabled right here. The next time it's enabled is right here. And the next time it's enabled, our inputs are zero, zero, one. That corresponds to output one. So output one will go low while everything else stays high. And then when E1 goes high, everything is disabled again. 
The next time it's enabled, we now have 0, 1, 0, which corresponds to output 2. So output 2 will go low while everything else will stay high. And you can see that it's a pattern. It's cycling through each one of the outputs in order. Because A2, A1, and A0 are actually the waveforms for a counter. If you look closely at these waveforms, with each clock pulse, we're counting up in binary. So as we count up in binary, we go to the next available output, which is going to go low when it's active, because these are active low outputs. So if that output is not active, it should be high. Or if the entire DMUX is not active, every output should be high. That's why every time E1 goes high here, all of these are high. It's not enabled at this point. That is how a DMUX or a data distributor works. And that is the end of this lecture on MUXs and DMUXs.